Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Beat on BaltimoreBaseball.com. This is Dan Connolly, and my special guest today is Lynn Henning, the baseball columnist of the Detroit News. Lynn, thanks for joining me. Hey, Dan. I always enjoy talking not only to my uh, good amigo, Mr. Connolly, but uh, anybody from Baltimore because it's still probably my favorite stop in all of the big leagues. Well, okay, Seattle's up there, Boston, but... But Baltimore has always had a special place in my heart, and really so have the Orioles since I was a kid. They've always been my favorite team outside of the one here that I grew up with uh, to cover. And uh, I've always said if I could write baseball in any town other than Detroit, it would be Baltimore, and I mean it. That's kind of interesting because, first of all, I mean, you're a Michigan guy. You're a Michigan State yeah. guy. You're a Michigan guy. How did how did the interest in the Orioles, just when you were kind of growing up and kind of getting into baseball, they were good? Is that kind of I the bottom line of it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Dan, and and I really do. I always loved the way they played. And, I mean, I go back, I, again, uh, the, one of the benefits of uh, of white hair is that I can remember Jim Gentile and, and all those guys all the way back there, but then up to Aparicio and then Bluffery and, of course, the 66 team and Frank and the trade and all that stuff. And, and I always loved the way they played baseball. And then when I began covering them, uh, at big league ball, I really respected again how much the Orioles to me embodied baseball integrity. Plus, I loved Earl. One thing I loved about Earl, he was never condescending. He was always good to a to a young guy. I, I'll never forget that. That meant probably as much to me professionally as anything uh, in terms of one person in this game is how good Earl was and how consistent he was and how he didn't treat you condescendingly. And, and, and I really respect that to this very day. You know, we'll talk about the Detroit Tigers who are coming into Baltimore uh, starting Thursday. But you, you just kind of started this, Lynn, uh, Lynn and I'm kind of interested in, in hearing because you have obviously covered Sparky Anderson and you've covered yep. Jim, Jim Leland. Um, and now yep. you said you, you, know, you obviously had some discussion in times with Earl. Where would you put those three? Now, obviously, you're a little bit more intimately uh, connected to the other two. But when you look at those three, where would you rank them, or, or, or how similar are they? Oh, boy, is that a great question. Uh, I think, really, um, uh, Earl was just so perfect for, for the Orioles' reign. Uh, and when he came in there, and I believe it was 67, uh, um, he, he, he was just right for, for what that new – uh, rendition and iteration of Orioles baseball was going to be. And what I loved about him was he matched personality and expertise as well as anybody I've ever seen, genuinely so. I would right. put Leland right there with him. Sparky, of course, was Sparky, and there's a reason he's in the Hall of Fame. But I would also say, Dan, and I don't think this is disparaging Sparky, not many managers had teams as good as he had, right. uh, whether it was in Cincinnati or that 84 team in Detroit. Uh, and, and Sparky uh, was was excellent. Uh, there There is such a difficulty in parsing the three. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that uh, my respect for Earl Weaver and, and for, for Jim Leland in all facets, uh, is is hard to match, even when you're speaking uh, of a person of Sparky's qualities, uh, and they were immense. So, boy, that's a that's a real trinity, though you picked out there. Well, and you covered two of them, and and I I did not, unfortunately, I did grow up watching uh, Earl, but I did not, you know, obviously did not cover Earl. Uh, but I you know I cover a pretty good one now in Buck Showalter, who a lot yes, of people try do. to compare to, you know, he, they try to compare him to Earl. And I think there's you know, obviously there's a physical, somewhat of a physical resemblance there. Um, yep. But as far as you know, managerial style and stuff, I mean, Buck is is definitely well off the gas pedal more so than um, than Earl was. I mean, you know, Buck's Buck's players for the most part, they respect him and they like him, and he really tries to connect with them. You know, it doesn't always work, but he does try to connect with them. Earl didn't care. Earl was there to win, and if you could win for him, he didn't. You know, he'd get in your face, he'd yell at you, whatever. There, you know, some great Rick Dempsey stories about it. But ultimately, all he cared about was winning. And so, therefore, if you could help him win, he would put the personality things aside, and he'd put you in the lineup. And, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of you – know, it's a different breed of ballplayers now, and, and many of them probably couldn't handle, you know, being managed by Earl. So, 
um, I don't know. I just think it, was, it might have been a, a time going by, but, you know, some of the great, yeah. great stories about him. Well, that, and, and that also brings me to another point, too, about the Orioles. They always seemed to me, any time I was around them, to have immensely fine character people. And I don't care if it was Belanger or uh, if it uh, was uh, uh, Kenny Singleton or any of those guys. I mean, they were always just four square people in my estimation. I loved going into the Orioles clubhouse uh, because I always go- was going to deal with consummate professionals. And uh, and so when you couple that too, Dan, with the fact that Camden Yards is my favorite ballpark uh, in uh, Baltimore doesn't hurt uh, either, whether it's Little Italy or Brickies or any place else I might find my way to there. Uh, there's a reason that I have great, great love for, for Baltimore and for the Orioles. I, I simply do. I, I, I can't fake it. I can't make something up here. The ardor is really high. Well, you know, it's funny because the Detroit Tigers that you cover were here in Camden Yards in October of 2014. And you had to think probably were the the favorites in there because they had the three aces and they looked like they were, you know, could, could maybe get back to the World Series again. And then Delman Young rattles the ball into the left field corner, scores three, um, and – the Detroit Tigers really haven't been the same since. They ended up losing that series, you know, finishing last place last year, okay, a rebuilding year. But, you know, they're struggling again this year. And is there a, is there a curse of the Delmino going on? What, what's the situation, <laughs> Lynn? What is, what is the deal with, with these current Detroit Tigers? I remember uh, talking with you just ahead of that series uh, two years ago right. and uh, saying to you that I was picking the Orioles. And the reason was I didn't trust Detroit's bullpen. And, um, uh, it's not often I get into the prophecy business, but right. <laughs> that one was a, a fairly accurate call. And really, Dan, uh, I thought they were a thin team uh, that year for that reason primarily. Uh, now they are quite different, uh, really quite different. And uh, that's why you see, I think, uh, a little schizophrenia here right now, because they can be uh, one team one day and another team the next. That may, in fact... Uh, shake out, but uh, they, they have a tremendous lineup. There's no doubt about it. Uh, that one through nine can really damage the ball. Uh, the guys at the back end, uh, not so much. Iglesias is not a power guy. Uh, Iglesias isn't, but uh, uh, on top of that, uh, uh, even Anthony Ghost can score a guy from first um, or park one in the seat. So they, they, they've got a, a lot of firepower there. Uh, the, the, the big mystery to their batting order right now is Justin Upton, uh, and, and it makes no sense at 28 why he'd be striking out 40 some times already, uh, and, and just really having a tough time. But he's too good of a hitter, uh, and his track record obviously speaks to that over 10 years. And he's too young, so without him, they're still uh, doing pretty well. But one thing you're going to notice this weekend, Dan. Miguel Cabrera's power is not what it was. Uh, and I knew that coming into the year. I picked him to hit 25 home runs this year. And that's about the pace he's on right now. Uh, and, and at 33, I just think uh, you're probably seeing a, a little physical attrition there. And uh, that, that's ominous for Detroit because they owe him a couple hundred million dollars plus I get through this decade and, and into the next one. So it's a little different team, but you're going to like, uh, or at least you're going to be impressed, I think, by Nick Castellanos at third base. And this is no surprise. Uh, I kept telling people around here, you're wanting too much from him too early. He he started here when he was 21. You're going to have to let him grow up. Well, he's growing up a little bit. And uh, this is a really good hitter they've got at third base. Now, he's not going to match uh, Manny. In, in terms of uh, two-way skills, um, but uh, but but this guy is is really good. So they can do an awful lot on offense, uh, although some days it goes out. But I think really where they where they've done a, a pretty good job is repairing a bullpen, and yet their starting pitching is very uneven right now, and uh, that's going to have to shake out for them to contend. All right, some of the things that that, that strike me. Lynn, in looking at this team, is so far going into Wednesday's games, um, Upton has struck out 51 times. You you combine Cabrera, Victor Martinez, and Ian Kinsler, and there's 56 strikeouts. 
this guy yeah. struck out almost as much as, as three of, of, you know, the Tigers' best players. Um, the other thing that really strikes me on this offense is that, you know, obviously when we think Detroit, we think power. It's just, it's just what it is. I mean, you know, you, obviously there's, there's been good pitching over the years, but you think about that power. And, you know, when we, if you would have told me that Salta Lamacchia would have more home runs in, you know, in the middle of May – than J.D. Martinez or Victor Martinez or especially Miguel Cabrera, I know I'd, I'd be blown away. I mean, so is it just one of those things that some of those guys, you know, you're just going to wait on whether, I mean, you obviously went into uh, Miguel Cabrera, but some of those other guys you just expect is that, you know, as the summer gets gets hotter, the winter gets a little bit better, that these guys will kind of go back to their the form that we expect from the Detroit Tigers offensively? You would have to think that for sure. Uh, J.D. Martinez has been down a little bit, too, which, which is really a surprise. But, right. and, and I would think uh, at any point he uh, he probably moves back to fifth gear. But uh, the Upton thing is, is just uh, a little bit staggering, only because, again, uh, he's 28. Right. And when you played for as long as he has at 28, uh, this shouldn't be happening. Uh, not to be missing the ball uh, so consistently. Now, his batting eye is still very good. Uh, his, his strike zone judgment is excellent. It's not like he's going out of the zone or anything like that. He's just not making any contact. Now, th- th- this is one of the mysteries uh, of the universe at the moment. And for that reason, you'd have to look at it as being something of an aberration, even though it's lasted here a few weeks. And the expectation would be he, he's going to get back on track. If he does, then, then he's a real weapon. Uh, but uh, right now they're they're playing with him uh, shooting duds here. It, it just doesn't uh, it it just doesn't add up on any level. But it's still Dan. This team's division titles for all those years came because of their starting pitching primarily, right. and because they had a couple of guys in the middle of the order. And that's where it's still going to have to to really settle in. Jordan Zimmerman is is good and very good just exactly what they hoped they would get. Verlander's pitched much better than his stats and probably will be fine. Um, Nibal Sanchez had a better start last time around. It looks like he's uh, beginning to get back into his normal rhythm. But then Shane Green has been out with a finger blister for three weeks. He was throwing very, very, very well. Uh, They've got to get him back. And then the big mistake they made in the offseason, without question, was signing Mike Palfrey. Why they did this to the tune of two years and $16 million, $8 million a year, I have no idea. They got oversold, uh, and it was their loan off-season mistake, and it was probably a doozy. Uh, so they're going to really run into an ongoing issue there. They know it, and they're trying to figure out now how to remedy it. Right. If you look at this starting staff, you take away Zimmerman, who's you know 5-1 and one with a 110 ERA, and you take away Verlander, who, like you said, his stats aren't really there, but he has, you know, pitched I think five or six quality yeah. starts. Um, yeah. You take away those, you only get you only the Detroit Tigers only have two quality starts of nineteen if if the the guy on the mound isn't named uh, Verlander or or Zimmerman. So I mean, right. obviously that's I mean you can easily point to that and say okay that's the problem there. And I guess you know the bullpen, you know. Our, our old buddy Frankie is, is, is still getting it done, uh, you know, maybe not pretty, but it's, it's still getting done, right? So the bullpen's okay. It's just a matter of that th- those three, four, five starters doing something. That, that's the whole story. And uh, as we both know, if you're going to look at one component that's probably most going to define your playoff possibilities, it, it's going to be that rotation. And uh, that's why, Dan, coming into the season – I was uh, very suspect about this team. Um, I, I picked them to win 87 games and finish in third place. I don't know that that's too far off the mark right now. Uh, and, and for that reason, I, I'm not certain that this is going to get better. Here's how it can, and it's plausible. Those trades they made last July when they spun off David Price and Cespedes brought three quality young starting prospects into the system. Michael Fulmer, Matt Boyd, and uh, <laughs> I feel like Rick Perry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Fulmer, Matt Boyd, and uh, somebody I'm leaving out here and I can't understand why I'm hitting the metal block. But those three guys uh, have a chance to be uh, – oh, Daniel Norris. Uh, sure, sure. So, okay. Yeah. So, anyway, 
those three guys have a chance by next year to be 60% of, of a good rotation. I mean, they, they, they're all very talented guys. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's possible that they can get two of those guys going out. Michael Fulmer, for instance, just pretty darn well against the Nationals last night and is 2-1 and one in three starts. He has top-of-the-rotation stuff, like a number two guy and, and potentially an ace uh, material there. Um, Norris is, is getting back after he had some uh, vertebrae fractures in, in spring camp. He, he's going to be really good by next year, at least, and perhaps before then. And then Boyd um, is, is likely to replace Palfrey right now. I think Palfrey's got one more start. Friday night against the Orioles, and uh, after that it could be uh, uh, it could be trouble. Or tomorrow night, rather, and, and after that it could be really a case of him going to the bullpen. But those kid pitchers have a chance to bail out the rotation that right now has been so wobbly. Yeah, it's going to be interesting with with Homer because he may be able to be uh, the starting pitcher on Sunday. And he when he was coming out of high school in Oklahoma, he was the third best high school. Uh, prospect coming out of that draft, and the second one was yep. Archie Bradley, and the first one uh, was another Oklahoma kid. I mean, Bradley's Oklahoma too, so it was three best Oklahoma high school pitchers. The other one was a guy named Dylan Bundy, who's now in the Orioles bullpen. <laughs> so they never actually pitched against each other. I did ask Dylan that. He doesn't believe it. He said they lived about two hours, hour and a half, two hours away. So he's familiar with them, but he never uh, actually pitched against Homer from his recollection. So, um, okay, well, you know, you're talking about some of the young guys, and I, you did mention them, but. Give me a little bit more about Nick Castellanos, because this is a guy who is who's actually leading the American League as we speak in hitting. Um, number two guy in, in that group is a guy named Machado. So he's actually, this 24-year-old third baseman in Detroit actually is hitting a little bit better than the 23-year-old third baseman in Baltimore. You know, he, oh, he, boy. Was, a supplemental, he was a supplemental first-rounder. Right. I mean, what else can you tell us about this guy? And, and, you know, is he is this just a hot streak, or do you really think that this is a, a budding – potential budding superstar on the Tigers' hands. No, he's simply a good hitter and always has been and, and was going to be. Uh, they got very impatient around here, and I kept telling them, you're going to have to let this kid grow up. Let me put this a little bit in local perspective for you, too, uh, as far as your audience. In 011, when they drafted him, the Tigers had number one on their, their board, uh, a guy named, of course, Bryce Harper. Right. Number two was Nick Castellano. He made really? it all the way to four. Yep, he made it all the way to forty-four, and they couldn't believe it. So they jumped. Now he wanted a lot of money, and get this: the Tigers nearly lost him. Uh, they went to at eleven fifty that night. They didn't think they had a deal. This is the midnight deadline. They didn't think they had a deal. Uh, some point within the next eight minutes, the family called back and said, we'll do it, 3.5 or 3.6 million, whatever it was. The Tigers sent the email into the New York commissioner's office at 11.58. It wasn't received oh. until 12.03 or 12.05, deal dead. The Tigers had to prove with their email confirmation that showed 11.58 is when they hit the button that they had, in fact, beat the midnight deadline and that they still could sign him. That's how close they came to not having this kid. Wow. Wow. That's reminiscent of the Matt Weeders deal with the with the Orioles, where oh. I was told at 11.50, 11.49, and it was done. I got called back at 11.55 said, nope, we got it in. <laughs> so so it's, it's crazy when that kind of stuff goes down to the very last moment like that and then but, you know you look at, at the Orioles with leaders and obviously now the, the Tigers and, and, and getting the right guys at third base well and, and, and I can supplement your, your Castellanos story a little bit here with and this is important he was a shortstop in, in uh, southeast Florida uh, coming out of high school they immediately were going to move into third base because uh, of his body they did then the Tigers run into Victor Martinez uh, right blowing out his knee. They signed Prince Fielder. Now Cabrera has to go back to third base. They've got Prince Fielder at first. These guys look like they're going to be there forever um, right. because of Prince's contract and Cabrera's uh, inability to, uh, to, to, to be even considered to be moved. So 
they, they were very happy with that situation, except what do we do now with Castellanos? They move him to the outfield in the minor leagues for a year and a half. Then the Tigers somehow are able to offload Prince's contract. Now they can move Cabrera back to first, and they need Castellanos to be their new third baseman. He hadn't played it in a year and a half, but now he's starting in the big league at uh, 21 uh, at third base, which he'd only been playing a little while in the minor leagues anyway. So it's been a bit of a problem, but his defense has picked up too, and of course the bat has now taken off. Right, and anything that gets to the left side, he can just stand there and let the other guy get it, right? I, I love watching Iglesias play shortstop, yeah. that's for sure. Well, and, and true, but the irony is Iglesias isn't quite as good going to his right as he is to his left. So oh, really? Okay. It, it, yeah, they, it, it, he would fool you there, Dan. Um, but that's what uh, that, that's what the analytics certainly hmm. confirm. But um, Castellanos, while he's not got great range, um, is really improving his footwork. Omar Vizquel has been working with him night and day. And, and they hmm. have themselves now a guy who's not only, of course, uh, taking off uh, with the bat, but that uh, his defense, uh, you can see, has, has also improved somewhat. Now, you know, when you look at this team, Lynn, I mean, obviously we talked about maybe rebuilding a little bit last year and the, and the trades that you talked about. But, you know, they still go out and spend money. That's what the the owner of the, the Tigers, Mike Oates, does. And, you know, you're looking at a $200 million payroll, and it's obviously right. not, you know, it's obviously not producing right now. So the big question, and I know you've written about it in the Detroit News, but, but the big question is, is Brad Ausmus on the hot seat? I know people have been questioning his moves all year now and pretty much last year as well, but is he on the hot seat? Do you think there's going to be a change in, in, in the managerial leadership in Detroit, or do you think they're just going to hold on and see what Ausmus can do and how these guys can respond under him? Uh, you've just spoken eloquently to the politics of the situation with, it, with that kind of payroll. And uh, with uh, uh, the, the constituents, the fans out here, not having been Osmus fans to begin with, uh, you can imagine that between them and an owner, uh, there's going to be increasing pressure on the front office to change managers, even if the front office knows that's not going to make a dime's worth of difference with this team. And, and it really won't. Um, it, that, that, but that's the reality. My thought after Sunday, Dan, after they had lost six in a row, is that going into Washington and then into Baltimore could mean that this would be Brad Osmus's final week as manager. I, I think it was it was very close to that. I think it remains reasonably close to that. Should uh, they not get out of Washington with a win today and then things go to pieces in, in Baltimore as well, they could. Uh, I think uh, they, they could be making a move. Uh, it's not going to change matters here. Um, they've got a team that, um, unless some things change, I think needs to really, really seriously dwell on July and the trade deadline. And, again, moving as many parts as they can, which in their case would be a lot of talent that would be mightily sought by playoff contenders that are looking for an edge. They'd have a tremendous amount of talent to offer there. And I think they're going to have to do that because they have to look long-term. I don't see them as being a really good, viable playoff team. And if you're not going to be that, all you're doing is postponing the day of reckoning. I'd look for a July offload. If that happens, Lynn, who do you, what are the names that, that you think will be most uh, sharp? You'd begin with Victor Martinez, uh, even at 37, and even though he carries a contract uh, uh, for two years after this. He's still, Dan, he's such a good hitter. And, and let's face it, a switch hitter of his elite skill, what a difference that could make in ball games for a, planet, for a pennant contender. Uh, you'd look at him, uh, Anibal Sanchez um, at, at 32, he can still help a rotation for sure as long as his health holds up. Ian Kinsler, about as good a baseball player, capital B, capital P, as you're going to find. Uh, at 34, almost 34 next month, um, he would be very attractive. You're not going to move Verlander or Miguel Cabrera because of their contracts. But J.D. Martinez, who signed through next year, and Upton, assuming Upton comes out of this funk, I think you could 
definitely consider all of those guys extremely marketable and uh, very, very seductive for the Tigers to consider dealing, given the fact that at some point they're going to have to reseed and retool. And I think that time has probably come. You know, it's interesting because you mentioned two names there, and I don't know where the Orioles have put them, but Buck Schulter has always been a huge, huge fan of Victor Martinez. He thinks he's one of the best, most professional hitters in, in the game. And also, you know, he's had he had Kinsler, and he knows Kinsler. So that's kind of an interesting deal. But I don't know if the Orioles, you know, their problem right now is obviously if they need to bolster their starting pitching. So let me get the last question with Lynn Henning of the Detroit News. Just, you know, from afar, and you talked about your, your you know, uh, I guess adoration for the Orioles over the years, but this yep. team now, when you look at them, are they a, are they a pennant contender? We know they're you know they're battling for first place in the American League East, but are they a team that you think can you know from afar you think can kind of keep it going into September? I sure do, and uh, of course all I have to do is is begin with that lineup. You've got so many people hitting and so many people who should be hitting and who haven't been hitting, and once they begin to catch up. Uh, now you've got uh, a lineup that is going to be exceedingly monstrous, and and I love that fact. When, when you get Weeders and Adam Jones and 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 and, and Davis and a few of those people going, um, there there aren't any outs in, in that order, at least not many. And uh, that's going to be something to behold. Your bullpen is <laughs> Kansas City good right now. I mean, that, this right. is this is some kind of back end and. I can't believe how good this bullpen's been. But, but Dan, you know, I, I've said, and you agree, if you're going to get into starters, uh, that's going to probably be the determinant. And right. I could see at the trade deadline the Orioles adding an arm here that they're going to need. There's no way around it. You're going to need a very stable starting pitcher in July. And, and if you can hang on here, because there's three teams in the East that have a chance, the Orioles, the Red Sox, and, and the Jays, and it, a starting pitching pitcher is going to be so important. Now we all know the Red Sox and Dombrowski are going to trade heaven and earth to get all the help they need. Not that they're going to need a lot, but still the Orioles have that shot. And uh, I, I just think I think it's remarkable that given the fact the starters have been so uneven, that the Orioles are in first place. But that also speaks. So what can happen here, particularly when you get the rest of the offense cooking, and and, and maybe add that arm or so at the at the July deadline. I I love the Orioles' makeup and their chances in 2016. It's that simple. All right. Well, I appreciate you spending your time with me here, Lynn Henning of the Detroit News, my good buddy. I will see you starting uh, Thursday, hopefully, and uh, you know otherwise, make sure you, you check out Lynn's stuff on the Detroit News. Um, Thanks again, buddy. I really appreciate everything, and uh, and hopefully have a good season. It's going to be an interesting season in Detroit, that's for sure. It is, Dan. Hey, good luck on the new gig. Happy for you. All right. Take care, Lynn. That was Lynn Henning and Dan Conley on BaltimoreBaseball.com. Thanks for listening.